start our introduction, so my name is Brad Chan. I'm the founder of Paymarket HQ and also run a, a family business of property, so uh, a little bit diverse. Uh, now, can I firstly uh, welcome David to the stage tonight. Uh, it really is a privilege uh, to have him here, and also welcome all of you for uh, attending. Uh, I'm going to sound a bit like a fanboy at first, and just sort of say, um, yeah, I was thinking if someone asked me, said to me I could interview any business person in Australia, um, I probably would have answered David Doty. So you know, this is uh, personally um, a real privilege for me, but um, I'm not going to uh, be too soft on him. I'm going to try and really just get to understanding David, his career journey, his life, and you know, hopefully also what makes him tick. So we might get straight into the questions. Um, and David, we just had a brief chat beforehand. He said to me, Brad, you can ask me anything. So I did I, say that. <laughs> is there any media here at all? Besides just being on social media. <laughs> Actually, you've you got to assume, don't you? Because whatever I say could be out there now. Okay, well, no one put their hand up in the media, so I think we'll be safe. <laughs> Okay, so I mean, I think most of you, I might start off, most of you will be aware of David through his time at Telstra. He's you know, six years as CEO there, um, doubled the value of Telstra from about 40 billion to about 80 billion um, share price doubled. So really successful there, but uh, not not many of you would be aware of his time before Telstra. So I might start off there. So uh, David, before you joined Telstra, you were CEO of IBM. Australia and New Zealand. Um, you spent 22 years there, so the last two years as CEO. I mean, that's that's a long time to spend in one company. That is one career, just about. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. I should quickly say I did a degree in anthropology and English as well before I joined IBM, and it was in that wonderful time in the computer industry when it didn't matter what you know uh, undergrad degree you did. They used to have to do the IBM IQ test. You probably see, none of you remember the IBM IQ test. Ah, there is one person, which was legendary. It was like sort of doing the Google test today. And uh, and that's, uh, and they hired me and then I did two years of training. Two years of training at IBM. Came across, I, I joined in New Zealand and then uh, came to Sydney and, and started as an assembler program. Any, who are the programmers here tonight? So, any assembler programmers? You see, it's very interesting, Brad. Assembler is like, just like machine code, just about. It's sort of one level off machine code. So, I've always had this um, knowledge of how computers work, because they still work the same way today, basically. So, anyway, yeah, 22 years, 21 years actually. Like. <laughs> so, were you ambitious at IBM? Yeah, look, I'm not sure ambitious. I've always been, I don't like losing. I, I like doing a really good job and I have always had that view that I never left a job the way I found it. And the very fact that you have that attitude always causes you to think about how you can improve things. And therefore in that sense, you know, I, I would always think about, well, how, what would I do in that situation? So I think that was more driven. So I never, I can't remember consciously thinking my aspiration is to be CEO. Right? Um, but I, I would also say there were certain people along the way, and you would know that in your own career, who sort of pulled me aside and sort of said, "Well, David, you know, if you want to, you know, I think you could." And that meant an awful lot uh, because that sort of gave you, well, people saw something in me, I presume that they wanted to, they thought could go further. So just remember, little words you say to people can really make a difference in their careers. Okay, but you know, it, it took you 20 years to become CEO of that one company. I mean, you, you wouldn't call it a meteoric rise. <laughs> <laughs> what stopped you from great. rising faster? <laughs> well, look, in those days, um, I mean, look, I think working life changed a lot. I mean, big corporates, uh, you know, 20 years in a company, was not that long, in, in, really, in, in the 70s. Um, but also, I, I started, remember, in big corporates, uh, you move around. So I started as a systems engineer, moved into marketing, and and I didn't become a manager of people for eight years. Eight years, I wasn't managing. I moved to Australia, then I moved, then I lived in Japan for five years, 
and have different jobs probably every two years. So I moved from you know, engineering to sales to marketing to management to working across Asia, working in China in the early 90s when you know, China was open, great wall of China business we set up, Taiwan, India. So I, I had, because you, you moved, so it wasn't, it never felt like working for one company. It, it felt like we were changing. And so, and I got, and I, and I would get um, frustrated with, you know, I'd say, oh, I don't want to move on. And, and I did leave it, just to think about leaving a couple of times, but there was just never the opportunity. So, yeah, it feel, I thought it was pretty quick, actually. You know. <laughs> IBM, so you're, you're in CEO of IBM, and so, you know, you probably could have then gone on to the CEO position of another large corporation, but instead you went to Telstra, uh, not as CEO. I mean, so why? What was the reasoning behind that? Well, it was it was a number of different reasons. Firstly, uh, I had an aspiration to work for a public listed company, and let me assure you, being CEO of a public listed company is fundamentally different to being if I was being. Um, critical, the branch manager of IBM in Australia or a country general manager. And the, the thought of going from being, you know, in a very big, well-structured multinational where you would never talk to analysts, you know, as a IBM CEO. I mean, you just, analysts, when you never talk to the street, to going to be CEO of a listed company straight up was, would be, is a very big step. Secondly, um, I did go to run the mobiles division, which was then a separate company within Telstra. And wireless was just, mobiles was just really, it was in what, 2000. And I think the market penetration was about 50%. Uh, you know, people had mobiles, whereas now it's 200 and something. So it was right at that thing. Remember um, OneTel? Yep. Remember OneTel? Yep. Literally, two months after I arrived at, uh, at Run Telstra Mobiles, one tell imploded, and we picked up 10% market share. So it was just one of those really nice times. So, but yeah, it's, um, and sometimes luck, luck is important in life. Um, so, but that was why. And then, um, and just to carry on through a little bit more, Brad, then remember Ziggy Swakowski was there, and Ziggy left after, you know, great dramas on the board. And I did not put my name forward as CEO because I didn't feel ready to be CEO of that company at that time. It was only when, um, after Sol had been here, that I, I really had a commitment. I really knew I wanted to do it. And, and I was very clear that I wanted to do it. So some people, you know, sometimes people want the status in life, but actually you've got to really know what you want. And it's hard. And, um, so, so it was a journey for me. It was a journey for me. I was, I was, when I put my name forward, I knew that what I wanted to do. Yeah. Okay, it was a long journey as well. I mean, it took you eight years in Telstra to become CEO. It did. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, it was so, so I, I was just going to say, was I, am I was the oldest CEO in Telstra. So, um, I don't think I was. So, what, I, I was, uh, so it was in 2000, I was what? Um, 40, just early 50s. I went there and then so I was 57. Yeah, look, probably, yeah. But look, you know, age is a funny thing, isn't it? Um, you know, the, you know, sometimes it takes time to get, get ready. And I think you've got to be more, more truthful with yourself about your readiness to do something than an age. And if you're just doing it to climb up the totem pole, I'd say think again, you know. Um, You've got, to have, you've got to be satisfied with what you're doing. You've got to know that that's why you want to do it. Because I've seen too many people who are like, you know, shooting stars. They they go really quickly, but there's no substance, and they don't succeed in the long run. So, hey, everyone's career is slightly different, but uh, yeah, talk forever. You know. Culture in, I mean, this place has a culture, right? You walk in and um, the team here, you, what you do, Brad, has an influence here. And, it's, and, and never, there's no perfect culture, um, but 
you try to, but it does exist, and you want to bring out the best. The culture in Tosh was always there. I mean, they are, I mean, from being, you know, there's bad things to do, but there's really good things about Tosh. If you ask a Telstra person, a technician, to tell stories about when they were, you know, it's been raining for 10 months and, you know, they were fixing, you know, copper thing, they tell stories that would just blow your mind, you know, and the commitment and the dedication. People have worked their whole lives there, and and that commitment is hard to replicate. So sometimes it's about lifting that out and putting it into a new context. So I don't think I necessarily changed the culture, but I definitely reinforced what I thought was valuable at that time. Now, was there bad parts of the bureaucratic, slow moving at times? Probably still is, you know, I don't know. Um, but big organizations are like that, and so you want to change that. So I am the view also in today's world with information flows, I mean, uh, and you know, just the way, do you know how many layers of management there are in the There were, it's like Groundhog Day. There's 13 layers of management when I was there, and every year we tried to get it down to nine, but they're growing, you know. <laughs> and I don't know what the number is now, but there is this just big organizations and people's meaning comes from being, you know, somewhere in the hierarchy. And of course, that's so wrong. It's about what you do and, and the difference you make. It's not about how many people you have reporting to. So, um, so what you have to do is to say, well, culture is a thing that can help you implement what you want to do. Because I, as a CEO, you, in managing your people, can't tell people what to do in every moment. So I'm sitting here in Sydney. You know, if someone walks into a shop in Carafa, you know, I can't write a rule book. By the way, tell us you did try to write a rule book, it was about this thing, about how to behave. But what you can do is say what you stand for and give people the ability to make their own decision based on values. And that was the critical thing. So when McKinsey writes that, you know, culture eats uh, strategy for breakfast, I actually agree with that. It doesn't mean you don't need a strategy, but culture becomes a determinant of how people behave and how they make decisions. And if you get it right, then it just is incredibly powerful. So that's why. Now, how do you do that? Well, look, for us, and it's different every organization, we said, look, if you can, you know, the problem with organizations, and, and it doesn't matter if you're big or small, your tendency is you get inward look. I don't know about humankind, but we get more concerned about the internal stuff than the external stuff. And we end up believing our own stories rather than using the customer as the driver of change. So if you think about what you do, and all of us have customers in some way, the, the beauty I've realized around having a focus on customer service is that it never allows you to rest. You're always striving, you're always changing, you're always moving forward, and you never accept the status quo. And if you can do that, it changes your culture internally. Now, and that is really powerful, really powerful. Now, look, does Telstra have a perfect service culture? I'm, look, no one's perfect, it's not, and I don't know what it is today. But that's what we did, and we, we had honest discussions. We, we, we ran these meetings with every manager and got people in a room and talked about the truth, got them telling the truth, not trying to cover up, you know, and talking about what do we do different, and then we were united against an aspiration to change the customer experience. And even if we failed, and you know, people would come to me at cocktail and say, oh, you know, you're useless, you know, the service is crappy, you know, I've just been on the phone for 10 hours. And you know, I'd say, look, I'm really sorry to hear that, but I care, give me the details. And in that very moment of, of caring, even though we weren't perfect, and when then we'd I'd probably muck it up again, it changed the culture too. So it is really powerful and don't ever underestimate the power. So I mean, it's a bit of a long answer, but yeah. So it was both, we defined it, we taught it, we lived it. I, I, I tried to be an exemplar, but I failed as well, but it really meant something. Yeah. Well, our customer service. Did you ever get so frustrated and just have to say, "Listen, I'm the I'm the CEO. Just do it." <laughs> um, 
I don't think I did, but I, I did, uh, I used to go into the call centers and take calls as well on the other side. And, um, and on a few occasions after listening to an, a, you know, a, a poor customer being pushed around, you know, 10 different people, I'd say, look, I'm really sorry. And they'd say, look, it's actually David Thay, I'm C, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and I had a lifelong friend, you know, so, um, so I did do that. But, but that was the only, look, you don't have to do that, but you've got to be real. You can't live in the ivory tower. My career, um, and, and I think that this thing around resilience is really important. But, yeah, census, so census, I don't know, do you all remember Yellow pages, white pages, wonderful thing. You know, and we deliver pay, you know, these great door stops into your home. <laughs> and, uh, and it was turning over three and a half, four billion dollars and generating a billion dollars of cash every year. So when I um, became CEO, um, Sol Trio had said, um, uh, remember the Google Schmoogle comment? Anyone remember that? So, because you know, cause, um, Yellow Pages got search element, you know, so when you do a search on, uh, you could get, bring up different companies and provide a service. And uh, Solar believed that he was going to out Google Google by, and he called them Google Schmoogle, which was a very brave thing to do. Uh, <laughs> it's the world's sort of, it's not the largest company, I think Apple's the largest one, yeah. Google C. But, um, but when I became CEO, uh, we were trying to work out what we are going to do with the company. And, it was spinning off, we could have sold it for $5 billion. Three years later, we sold it for $750 million. Now, um, so I look at that and I think, gee, was, that wasn't a great share on that. Um, and, um, but there were a whole lot of things, Brad, in that. You know, when we took out, we were really capital constrained. We were spinning off a billion dollars of cash. If we had have sold it, um, we know shareholders would have wanted back in dividends, so I couldn't have used the money. So we needed the cash in that period. Um, we we had a CEO who was very good, who believed he could move to, to a digital company, and uh, we'd move all our printing into very low cost areas. And so he had a belief he could change it, and uh, we sort of believed it, and so going back, we probably realized we couldn't. So yeah, so it was a bit, it was a, it was a disappointment, and and it, it had a lot of great assets like Telecom New Zealand sold their yellow pages I think for a billion and a half, that's like a year before I took over CEO. So so yeah, so it's good to reflect on bad decisions, you know, about why you did it. But so part fifty percent was understandable, fifty percent was bad judgment. Okay. Well, and you made a lot of money from the NBN anyway, so. Yeah. Technology was having on business and allowing you to do things differently. The, the changes that it was bringing society and uh, about empowering people and disintermediating things. And so, and when you're in a big organisation, it's really hard to get change. And so, when we set up first in Moro D, um, it was because we weren't going fast enough in our R and D work. And we thought if we could, you know, start to, um, you know, see. You know, new ways of approaching things. And Annie Parker, do you know Annie? Who's sort of, you know, yeah, you don't, not many people. Annie was running more of D. She came out from the UK. She was a fireball. But it was fascinating. Even though I spent a lot of time there, I really enjoyed my time because I met great people. The truth is that they were a really positive influence back into the organisation. So our engineers would go out there, they'd come back and say, oh, I could do this. And they, and, and of course the, you know, the people who were coming with great ideas loved to talk to engineers because they had, you know, experience, and great, you know, insights into networks and, you know, we had a lot of people in technology. So that's why we did Muru D. I have a really, I mean, I've worked in Asia for, gee, well, I've worked in Asia the last 25 years, uh, from one way or the other. And remember that Telstra, invested in China and you know it was probably one of the few companies that I think we took half a billion dollars of value out of China out of this. Um, so uh, I've always believed that Australian companies should look to Asia. Now you hear that rhetoric a lot. But um, 
But you know, Australia's a small country. You know, we're what? One point two percent of the world's GDP. Um, Twenty four point four million wonderful people. But that's what. So I think California. What's the population of California? Even I think San Francisco is probably twenty million. So for Australia, we need to be oriented to Asia. Now, what people? There is no Asia. There's Philippines, there's Vietnam, there's Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, India, and they're not all the same countries. And, and you know, and people don't spend enough time understanding, you know, what those markets are like. But if we do, you know, half the world GDP will be throughout the Asian region. I think. So I just don't know why people don't see it. Now I do know why, because uh, investors and most mostly domestic investors don't like Australian companies because there'll be a lot of failures. But it's because their perspective is one year, two year, three. If you go and you want to do business across the Asian countries, you've got to look at 20, 30, 40 years. And and that we are too short sighted. And uh, so if you're going to do it, know that you're going for the long term. And and I look at all these countries, go in, they go out. They go in, they go out. And it's about building long term Deep relationships, but business understanding, understanding the market, all that. So I'm a great advocate of doing business relations, but it's a long, it's a long time. Mm. Yeah, and I guess the problem with the likes of Telstra or Hans and others that have had an Asia strategy is that can change pretty quickly with the with the new CEO. That's exactly right, and I think um, the role of boards is um, just because a you know the economy changes, markets change. You know, you make these you know, strategic decisions for the long term, and just because it goes a bit bad for six months, you know, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean you pull out. And I think it's a great strategy. Now, I think sometimes the strategy of people going to another country. I mean, if you use different strategic, you know, uh, let's say you, you you know the Bain. You know, value from the core and you know, not do two steps from the center. Do you know that one? Okay, so the theory goes most of your value comes from your core business. You can go to one adjacency, i.e., an adjacency, uh, maybe an industry, or you go to another country with the same product. But if you go to two steps away from the core, i.e., a new product in a new market, it's very hard to make money. And it sort of makes sense, doesn't it? You know, because you've got too many variables. But you know, often we just try to replicate a model here in Australia and just plonk it into, I don't know, Cambodia. And that doesn't work. You've got to know your core capability and then implement it in a smart way. And so if I was a bank, I'd never go and buy, you know, uh, bricks and mortar in Asia. I'd go with a digital strategy, wouldn't you? You know, I mean, why would you go and buy bricks and mortar when there's a whole generation of disruption? So I think people don't think through this strategy. Well. Yeah. Sorry, that's a little bit. Of there are three key ingredients to wealth creation: so, uh, same house, same spouse, and same car. Now, I read, I read, I think a few years ago, you decided to upgrade your Corolla with a, a new Corolla. Yes, I went, now, I went for the hybrid one. Have a great step. You know. It cost me, you know, at least another three thousand dollars. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you obviously could have bought any car that you wanted. Uh, you bought one of the cheaper cars. Hey, Toyota's a great <laughs> brand. <laughs> Very low maintenance cars. Look, um, everybody has their foibles in life, and uh, look, cars are just not. It gets me from A to B. I happen to live in Low North Shore, and, and, and the most I would drive. I used to catch the ferry uh, in the wood. Um, and I just don't need a big car, never have. Um, and so I can't justify to myself, you know, 100,000 or whatever. And it just doesn't give me pleasure. I have other indulgences like that I spend money on, but it's just on cars. So, but it's interesting, isn't it, how we, how we look to people and actually classify them, the type of people that buy the car they drive. Pretty superficial, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, so sometimes I quite like being a little bit, you know, not quite conformed to. 
later we expect our business leaders to be a certain model. Now, you're very different. You're, you know, you're, you're very humble. You're not a, a flashy person. And you've got a particular view on, on real leadership. Can you want to maybe just talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, and look, there's a lot being written about, you know, leadership. So I'm not sure it's anything um, new. But look, the days of, um, you know, autocratic, all knowing, all wise CEOs, leaders, probably was never true. I mean, even you see, everyone see the Churchill movie? I mean, was that incredible insight to Churchill who's suffering depression and rehearsed his speeches to the nth degree? I mean, no, you wouldn't necessarily know that. But, you know, the, or, and he had serious doubts about himself. I mean, any leader has doubts about themselves. So the thought that you would ever put one individual on a pedestal and give them all authority and that they were perfect was just not true. Just not true. Do you know any perfect people? So, but what what great leadership is, is people who have the authenticity to confront their fears and in the face of those fears and failings to still believe in something. And, and that to me is great leadership. And everyone's a leader in that sense. And I do think that great leaders, you know, I mean, look, you've got to have a great, you've got to know yourself and have confidence in yourself. I mean, otherwise, why are you doing it? But there's also the sense about doing, you know, really engaging with people and really wanting to make a difference in people's lives. And so this whole purpose driven leadership is really important. I mean, I think it's really important. And and you see it, the people who really do well in life and come out the other end with a reasonable you know, life that's not totally messed up, are the people who are driven by things that are deeper than just making a lot of money. So, so I have a very different view. That doesn't mean you shouldn't make a lot of money or you shouldn't do well in business. I'm not saying that. But I think there's a way to do it. And um, so, um, yeah, and I think therefore you look at the qualities of leaders and how we train leaders. I mean, I still think there's a lot of leaders who never invest enough time in really understanding themselves. Um, and I don't know if you, you know, I'm sure you've all done, you know, psychoanalysis and all that stuff. Look, you don't want to get too carried away, but you've got to know what makes you self tech and what you're good at doing, what you're not good at doing. And, um, and then once you do that, then you give in your peace with yourself, and at least you can get on to it. Okay. Black Walls. You know, recently took a pay cut to go to to Australia Post. Now she also credits. Uh, she uh, I think moved from the UK to here, uh, working for Telstra, and she actually credits you for bringing her over and believing in her. What did you see in her? Um. Is any of you met Christine? Have you met Christine? You know? Yeah. Well, she's um, she's incredibly driven. She's articulate. She has incredible values. Um, she's smart. She is incredibly committed to whatever she does. I mean, if you look at what she's done with Blackmores. And she has an ability to work with people to help them succeed and just go to that next level. She's got a degree of inspiration, not charisma, but she is quite a critic. But, um, you know, she arrived from the UK, and I think it was in winter, and she was still thinking, oh, it's gonna be summer in Sydney. And so she walked in my office with, you know, a, um, I think a very light blouse on or something. And, uh, but she was just, she captivated me. And, uh, and she was an incredible contributor and, Tells her they're not to back for us. I think she'll, you know, Aussie Post is a tough gig, um, but I think she'll do very well. But she'll bring enthusiasm and drive and great integrity as well. So I think she'll do well. And as I talked about as we kick off, I, I don't like, I mean, not perfectionist, because I, I have a, but I don't like failing and I don't like, and I like, same things around, quite resilient. Um, so, you know, when, resilience is really important. You know, we all fail, 
and you know I've lost more deals, sales deals, and, and things. But that ability to fail and get back up and do it again is really important because all of us have to go through that. But a lot of people don't. A lot of people get pushed around and they can't get back up. Never take yourself that seriously, you know. We all get up and do it. So I think I've got I, I enjoy people. I, I actually, honestly, I get energy from talking to people and I get energy from seeing them be successful. Um, so I think I'm probably naturally good at that. Um, so I think they're on the, on the strengths and and I have quite a good sense of where people are coming from. So, I think, look, integrity is really important for me. Um, I need to be able to look people in the eye and know that they're there. And so I've probably developed um, a reasonable ability to judge people through that. So that would be my strengths. My weaknesses are probably equally as long as that. But, um, you know, sometimes I'm impatient, but I can learn to manage that. Um, there's times you show it, but I, um, I was telling you before, um, in my early days, I was told I was too impulsive. Um, and yet, at the end of my career, one of the Christmas people would say to me, well, David, you take too long to make a decision. <laughs> uh, and, and somewhere, I, I, lived, I, was, I lived in Japan for five years, and if you live in Japan, the whole concept of consensus building in Nima Washington is very important. Um, so I probably learned some of those skills, but I also learned to be more considered. Things are not always what they appear. Um, and sometimes you have to let things unpick a bit before you make a decision. And, but there are times you're just going to make a call as well, so you've got to find that right balance. So there are a few of my orders. So uh, you were born. What values would you, I guess, hope to have passed down to them? Yeah. And as my sort of profile, people, look, I hope that they, the, the, the overall overriding value is be true to yourself. But, you know, for the, you've got children, you know, it, it's a hard one to know. I mean, they're all thankfully doing what they want to do and, and enjoying it. Um, Look, I, you, know, you want your kids to be happy, don't you? I mean, that's the, and be content with what they're doing. But with that, and knowing who I am and who my wife is, um, being a degree of, well, doing what you like and doing it well is a part of being happy. And so I think they looked at me and said, Dad, you work two long hours, and you call the animal you. Uh, and thankfully they haven't done any of that, they have not done other things. But, but still I think those values, I hope that they continue about doing the best they can, making a difference and doing what they believe in is really important, I hope that is. Yeah. And what about the level of expectation on them? I mean you're a hugely successful public figure, you know, you can imagine that the children of someone would have certain expectations wherever they are, whether it's at school, whether it's their first job. Um, has that been an issue? You haven't met my wife here, Brad, <laughs> um, who is um, not impressed with status or anything. Uh, look, she has kept um, me and, and the, you know, the kids very grounded through that period. And uh, I mean, she has her own career as well, but she um, she's not she doesn't really care what the title is. Or, she looks for the person and. Uh, I think she's probably still that in the, in the children's home. Um, I think it's, uh, I never think of it as driving. It's where I get satisfaction. Um, I enjoy working at jobs in New South Wales because jobs are really important. I mean, look, yeah, it's political, it's bureaucratic at times, uh, and you know, ministers come and go, but but creating a community where jobs are is really important, and maybe we only make a little difference, and that means something. Um, you know, CSIRO, I fundamentally, fundamentally believe in the importance of science and research to make a difference in this country. So, if I can make a difference, but is it frustrating some days? Yeah. Um, I enjoy venture capital, it's fun. 
um, and I enjoy uh, investing in companies. So it's more where I, I, where I get satisfaction. The drive that comes afterwards about, well, I'm not going to let this go until we get something done. So that's why I do it. And I think most of my career has been around that. And just, um, and not also just falling into a nice, easy mold and then saying, hey, how do we make this work? Mm. I'm, there's a very good book written by, as you know, you probably won't agree with This is for 50 year olds, but um, <laughs> um, there's not many over 50. But it's, um, it's called The Portfolio Life. So at some point it may be relevant, a guy called David Coventry. And he basically says, um, think of your life and your career in decades. Um, and also he says, think you're going to work until you're 90. Which actually I think is a good thing. Um, that's not because of tax or it's just it's just just that you always giving you you always working um, and this idea of retirement is a really bad idea. Um, we all keep contributing in some way, and you look at the people who who are you know energy energy the people who keep giving back, and so I think of you know this is a period in my life when I can. Do a few more different things, and I can contribute in different ways back into the you know, community or business. And so that's what I'm doing. And you know, in my so I'm 63, 64 now. So you know, I plan to live till I'm 90 if I'm lucky. Maybe I'll go further. I don't know. Um, and and then I can do different things in those periods. So that's our thing. So I I will continue to think about <coughs> listed companies, venture uh, capital. Um, if I can contribute back in policy areas of government, I will. It's difficult, it's not always easy. I think that there's an enormous need for greater collaboration between you know, government, public service, academics, and business about an aspiration for this country. I feel very passionate about that. And we don't talk enough about it. And there's too many critical, cynical people. We need to celebrate success and encourage people. And if I can contribute to that, I will. What about politics? There's no media here. Politics. Imagine me in politics. Um, uh, no, politics is never... Um, I respect politicians. I want to... Um, because we, we give them a bum rap at times. So it's a tough job being a politician. Um, sometimes they make it tougher for themselves. Um, but I think it's a very admirable thing to do. But I know... I think I, I, for my personality and what I enjoy doing, I can be more effective outside that. But I do work with politicians, and I, um, you know, they, um, and the good ones really are there for the right reasons. Um, results that are off forecast, you know, you the front page of the newspaper, Telstra misses every forecast, Though he should be sacked, you know, <laughs> and then you think, should, then you think, why am I doing this? Um, uh, actually, you know, actually, they they weren't very stressed. The stressful part to me is when, um, you know, stress comes from when you feel like you're not achieving what you wanted, or you're, you're not. There's that control factor as well, when or, or your aspiration and the reality. That's when stress really kicks in, always. Um, and so, being able to recognise that. And then, and then just reflecting on it was always a useful way for me to manage that moment. But also um, knowing how you, you de-stress, um, for me it's about, you know, you know getting a degree of fitness, not a lot. You know, having other interests, doing other things, getting my mind off, off things. And when you're in very intense situations, you tend to get so focused you lose perspective. And so it's really important to take yourself out of that situation and um, and get perspective back in, into it. And then you think, you know, well, you know, I'm not dead, I'm still alive, you know, and that sort of thing. But, but, you, but all of us have stress. Recognising it is really important. And then, you know, working on what you do. Right. I think Australians are as, risk, as big a risk taker as, as any other nation. In mining, I mean, look at look at the incredible work. You know, mining, um, agriculture, areas that we know well, we are very good risk takers. Um, 
And the thing is that we've never had to really look outside of Australia to take risk elsewhere. So it's a very understandable reaction. To say, well, why would I go to Asia? You know, I can do stuff here, you know. What are we now? How many years of economic growth have we got? You know, 26 years of economic growth. So I think the risk aversion comes from what you know and what you don't know. However, the reality for Australia is that um, I think if you look at New South Wales, I think that in the GDP growth in New South Wales, 60% has come from the domestic economy. 60%. It's not sustainable. So, so if you look at the straight economics of it, unless we become a greater exporter or have more interest in the globe, our economy will slow. And that will be manifested in companies who are not doing as well. So really, I think that reality is slowly going to start to hit people. Then they will become less risk averse and they'll say, I have to go and do that. <coughs> now, not everyone would share that view, um, but I think that that is a reality of what's happening. And, um, and also, I mean, the, I, mean I, I just see incredible opportunity. And, you know, I mean, it takes time. And, just because you go there doesn't mean you're going to be successful, you've got to really work hard. Um, but it's really important to do it. I mean, also for a great modern cultural society. Yeah. In Australia, I mean, it's one to celebrate and recognise. Um, you know, just, you know, the, you know, the Colombo plan, you know, we have all these people with resources, but wonderful people who you know, come to in educate in Australia, they go back to the countries. They have a, a, a you know, they talk about going to Bondi and Manly, and, but we don't leverage it, and I don't know why. But I think it goes back to probably the first question is that, um, you know, if you look at the ASX 100, how many of those companies have a strong Asian business? Anyone who's done the numbers? Um, Interestingly, um, uh, Port Jackson Partners here, so I'm going to leave it. Something about 70% of them have an, you know, have an Asian presence. So they put an office in Singapore, or maybe in Shanghai, maybe in Tokyo, or something. But when you look for those companies that are the majority is in Asia or offshore, it drops to less than 10%. Macquarie Bank is very good. Uh, one of the, uh, a lot of that business is actually US and Europe for this growing. Um, but there's very few outside of that. Um, and I think it gets back to this aspiration of Australian business and Australian business leaders and the market. Because, you know, we, we don't get rewarded for going to Asia, you know, stock gets stumped as you're a listed company. So they, they have stepped back from it. And I think it's really wrong. So we've got to find a way to do it and leverage the incredible capability we've got. I'm an advisor with Square Peg um, and an investor. So I invest in a, a long side. Um, look, I think the venture capital <coughs> has come a long way in the last probably eight months, two years. I mean, there's obviously more money around. Um, there's a growing maturity in you know what the people who are in the venture capital um, market and I think there's a growing awareness uh, across the whole investment from you know where we're big super funds and uh, all the way down. So I think it's actually a, um, a very positive time. Um, I we're still seeing a lot of really good companies. Um, there's some you know discussion around the you know the supplies trade. I actually don't believe that. I think um, there's some really good companies. I think that um, Probably the biggest challenge at the moment is, is you know, money's one part of the equation, but more is the quality of the people in the venture capital working with those companies to help them be successful. And we need more really good people who've been through it and then invest back in. And I think we can do really well. I mean, I, um, but we've got to be careful we don't, we've got to be us, you know, like what is Australia good at and, you know, not try to get too carried away. But um, you know, I, I see wonderful companies. I mean, uh, you know, Melbourne, Brisbane, you 
in Perth, and I've probably seen more through CSRO now, but maybe more early stage. But gee, there's some really clever people out there. We don't celebrate them enough, we don't talk about them enough. And so if you've got great examples, I, you know, if I can support them or get others to talk about it, because you know that generates energy and people say, ah, oh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, what about this? And so we need to keep that. And I think that's just the nature of business. I mean, that it's it's not in big corporations all the time. Big corporations do, it, but it's this great entrepreneurial community of you know, of real estate businesses. And, and look, I, I don't think money's the issue. I, I I think it's more than enough money around. But let's keep encouraging people. So my prognosis is very positive, and uh, I think it's improved a lot. We've got a long way. We're not, it's not a mature industry like the US, but it's on the way, so it's good. And we need it to be really strong. The, f the first thing as a CEO is um, what you walk past, you endorse. And um, so you have to lead, and where you see behaviors inconsistent values being your values or companies you've got to call it out and it's tough um, and I'm sure all of you have had situations where you've worked with them for a long time and there may be an indiscretion you have to make a call and and you've got to stand true to your principles and it's really hard so first of all you need to do that but you also need to set the expectations about what is acceptable behavior um, and that's really important. I mean, in companies like Telstra or big corporations, so um, you go out to function with teammates uh, and there's bad behavior. Is that the company's responsibility to <coughs> step in or not? My view is it is, because they're there on. And so you, you've got to draw the boundaries as well, where, where you will um, actually, what you will tolerate. So if I was a Uber, that's what I did. I'd say this is the way it is, and if you, um, and you've got to stand behind it. And um, it's like, you know, in come big corporations, you have whistle blower programs. I, mean, I would read everyone. I knew exactly what was going on. Um, if it wasn't resolved within 30 days, I'd be on it because people sit on them for months. It's just bad behaviour. It's not stepping to the issues. So. I think that's the only way to do it. So unfortunately, it comes back to what you personally accept is, um, is what gets done. And that's why it was right to find the CEO, but it was totally unacceptable for David. Yeah. Everyone just join me in thanking David. Uh, for <laughs> and, uh, so, so uh, seeing such an accomplished business leader as yourself, you know, that's so down to earth. So, you know, it's an inspiration for all of us. So, again, thank you for coming at your time, um, and thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.